This videotape was prepared so that you could see some of the instrumentation and some of the procedures that will be used during the experiment. This is the experiment room at Haskins Laboratories in New Haven, Connecticut. We plan to simultaneously record respiratory, laryngeal, and articulatory data. There are staff members at Haskins who provide technical assistance and a physician who carries out the medical procedures. All physiological data will be recorded on an FM tape recorder for subsequent computer analysis. The first procedure is to calibrate the respiratory signal. Respitrace is the system used to monitor the subject's chest and abdominal movements. The respiratory system consists of two cloth bands that are placed around the subject's abdomen and rib cage. The bands contain inductance coils that change their diameter in response to the change in the cross-sectional area of the chest and abdomen. A netting is placed over the subject's torso to keep the bands in place during the experiment. A small oscillator is attached to the bands. The oscillator will convert the volume changes of the chest and abdomen to voltage signals, which can then be tape recorded. Lung volumes can be derived from these area values by a calibration procedure that requires the subject to exhale into a sealed plastic bag of known volumetric capacity. This procedure is repeated while the subject is in a sitting, standing, and reclining position. A modified cell spot system will be used to monitor movement displacements of the articulators. Infrared emitting diodes are placed on the nose, the upper lip, the lower lip, and the jaw. The diodes are then exposed to an optoelectronic tracking system, including a camera that can monitor vertical and horizontal changes in the positions of the articulators. The nose is used as a referent so that head movements can be tracked and later eliminated from the other signals. The duration, amplitude, and velocity of the articulated movements can be obtained after the signals have been processed. Photoglottography is the procedure used for obtaining a view of the vocal folds. A fibroscope is the instrument that provides illumination of the larynx. First, the nose is lightly anesthetized with 2% xylocaine. Then, the tip of the flexible fibroscope is lightly lubricated and inserted gently into the nose until it reaches approximately 5 centimeters above the glottis. A cold light source is carried through the fibroscope to illuminate the vocal folds. The light passes through the glottis and is sensed by a phototransistor placed on the neck. Simultaneous videotaping of the vocal folds provides direct viewing of the vocal fold abduction and adduction. The subject is now prepared for the experiment to begin. The respiratrace has been calibrated so that information can be obtained on the subject's breathing patterns of inhalation and exhalation during speech. The infrared light emitting diodes have been carefully placed on the articulators so that movements of the lips and jaws can be tracked. Finally, the fiber optic endoscope has been inserted, providing information on laryngeal movements and giving a clear view of the opening and closing of the vocal folds. Now the experiment begins. Massachusetts this week became the first state in the nation to guarantee universal access to health insurance. An estimated 600,000 people who currently are not insured by their employers would be insured in a phased-in process over the next four years. But some say it will ruin the state's economy. Society often laughs at the stutterer, but researchers are giving the problem serious attention. Dan Rutz reports on therapy for this distressing speech disorder. It's good. There is a lot more to stuttering than meets the ear. Joseph Kalinowski is among an estimated two and a half million Americans for whom free speech does not come naturally. I live on...
word to lame. The problem is, uh, speech is a, is a complicated behavior. It's probably, it, it represents probably the most complicated motor skill uh, that we do. It's much more complicated than playing the piano, for instance. From the Haskins Laboratories in New Haven, Connecticut, speech pathologist Peter Alfonso is revealing the intricacies of plain talk. Robin Story, a University of Connecticut postgraduate student, designed specific experiments. Her subject for this one is also her doctoral colleague. Joe Kalinowski is not the first to take both a professional and personal interest in this affliction that affects people from every walk of life. Research shows stuttering is a physical disorder, not at all dependent on some nervous predisposition. There's always a, t a, a process of, of, of blaming yourself, and now I guess it can be said uh, uh, from this type of research that it seems to be something more neurologically based that you might not have as much control over it as you would hope. He see Pete again. He see Pete again. Not the message, but the messenger is important here. Through the flexible nose scope, the voice box is observed in action. Other probes monitor breathing, lip and jaw motions. A cool light down the throat, visible in a darkened room, triggers a sensor attached to the neck to precisely calculate each opening and closing of the vocal folds, the very origin of the voice. No fewer than 80 muscles work together to make speech possible. Well, this gives us the opportunity to see at any one point in time what the entire uh, motor system is doing. The graphs betray the stutterer, even during fluent speech, giving weight to the theory that stutterers always make speech differently than the so-called normal talkers. It means that uh, they are never, uh, quote, uh, uh, cured. That is, a stutterer is always a stutterer, uh, but they're after an appropriate therapy program, for instance, uh, he now has uh, those behavioral skills that would allow him or her to speak in a more fluent fashion. This is where new theories on stuttering are developed and tested. Some of those ideas have moved beyond the lab to those struggling so hard to achieve...